Sorry. Boom. Okay. Um, so Ryan, do you want to introduce our guest? Yeah, sure. I think she'd be better at, excuse me, introducing herself. But I met met Keely um, actually through LinkedIn. So yeah, <laughs> all the LinkedIn outreach that we've been doing, I'm not too sure how she found us, but uh, we got connected, um, had a few conversations. Uh, we had a one-on-one -on -one Zoom and thought that the Healthcare Sustainability Committee would be a good one for her to tap into and um, talk about her projects, which are really interesting. So I'll let her take it away. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Hi, everybody. It's nice to meet you. My name is Keely. And what I actually do is I work for a company that allows end users to take back control of their energy consumption through their streetlights. So effectively, think of the streetlights in, I'm assuming, your parking lots or even as you're just driving down the street, right? Have you ever actually thought about how much energy is going into those? How much cost is going into that, especially when we're talking about hospitals. So I think there's about eight people on the call right now. So let me just clarify, do you all work at hospitals or how exactly does that go? I'm seeing some nods. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So correct me if I'm wrong, you have some LED street lights going on in your parking lots, correct? Yes. Okay. Awesome. So a lot of people actually don't consider how much energy is being wasted through these streetlights and how they can actually taper that back and reduce their cost as well actually protect the environment because we're talking about light pollution. We're talking about the effects on human lives. We're talking about the effects on animal lives. I just heard a crazy statistic today that apparently dairy cows, when they're exposed to LED lights, then milk production goes down by 6%. So what's it doing to human beings, right? So I wanted to share my screen. I'm gonna actually turn my video off for a second, just so my Wi-Fi cooperates. Oh, okay. Uh, apparently I can't do screen sharing. Is that possible for me to do? Uh, wait, yeah, wait one second. Um, I should okay. be able to set you up. So wait a minute. All right, so you should be able to screen share. That's made you the co host. Okay. Okay, let's. Okay, let me know when you all can see that. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the company I'm with and what exactly we do. So, as a company, we have been here operating for about five years, turning streetlights smart. So, the Street lights that you're seeing right now, they're just going on and off. We change that. So we have over 91 patents issued. We are in 15 of the top 30 cities in the US, saving them money, helping with the environment, making sure that everybody is functioning better. So what do I mean when I say that? Well, before we get into it, I wanted to talk a little bit about who we actually do work with. So City of Philadelphia has taken 125,000 of our products for their streetlights to help reduce energy, prevent crime, and improve road safety. We also have Duke Energy. I know that you're all in Virginia, so I'm not too sure if you're familiar with Duke Energy, but they took over 600,000 Uber cells, our product that they're gonna be installing in the next three years. And our product is purely American made. We are very secure. We are trusted by the United States Army as well as the Marine Corps. So just wanted to throw that out there. So let's talk about what I'm actually talking about. This is the little device that goes on top of your streetlights. It is going to connect to an application that will then allow you to look at how much energy is being consumed and where you can cut back on that energy. So I wanted to put it into a little bit of numbers for you guys so it will make a bit of sense. So I understand that, you know, you have parking lots. Obviously, you I mean, you're not going to have 20,000 light poles, right? This is for a bigger city. But we are actually able to reduce costs by 31% when it comes to energy. And we're also able to reduce maintenance costs 
all these costs could be funneled back towards helping your patients, towards helping everything in the hospital run more smoothly. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm seeing some nods, awesome. So let's talk a little bit about what the product is. It's the little hardware that goes on top of a light pole and it connects to the LTE cellular network. From there, every single light pole is then individualized and put onto an application called UberView. And that is how you're gonna be able to control them, see your energy consumption, and see where you can reduce costs. So let's talk a little bit because I know how caring for the environment is your biggest thing, right? And that's a huge thing for us too. We wanna reduce light pollution. We wanna avoid the sky glow. We're gonna avoid light trespass trespassing glare. We're doing this by making sure that you can actually control these street lights and know that you're actually going to extend the life of your light pole. We are actually preventing degradation, which means less money spent and better protection for citizens because the light is still strong enough. Does that make sense so far? Okay, awesome. So we are a programmable software. So that means, let's give an example. You have a parking lot, right? So you, let's say you have about 20 of those light poles. You know that you need them on from 5 p.m. to about 5 a.m. during the summer. Okay, well, what about winter? What about when it gets darker faster? You can actually schedule it and not have to worry about it by scheduling it to start at 4 p.m. as opposed to 5 p.m. You don't have to go and flick a light manually. You can just do this from a laptop or from a tablet. We also have tilt monitoring. So say something happens in one of these parking lots. Let's say that a car actually backs into a light pole, causes the light pole to crash. Maybe you don't really know about it for hours on end, but you're actually gonna be notified immediately if something happens here. And when it comes to our product, we're also very proud of the fact that typically when it comes to LED street lights, someone has to tell you that there is an issue, right? Someone needs to come and tell your maintenance team that something's going on. Well, actually, this application tells you immediately if something is wrong with your street light. So it's just saving a lot of time, a lot of money on maintenance costs and trying to figure out what the issue is. Is that making sense so far? Awesome, awesome, awesome. So we all care about the environment. Ubiquia is very environment focused. We actually work we're actually working on legislation ourselves right now. It's kind of funny to, for me to listen in on your conversation because I know what it's like, right? We're in Washington right now. We're working on dark skies initiatives. So that's trying to reduce light pollution to help benefit human lives as well as animal lives. So we've discovered that with our product, we actually help dark sky friendly communities we are able to reduce the glare of the light. We are able to set the dimming at a lower level that is still applicable to the human eye. And if you look at this client of ours, actually in Massachusetts, they had 81% savings in energy consumption. That's, that's impressive, that's insane. You're saving so much money, you're saving so much pollution. It just helps benefit the whole big picture right there. So just as I wrap up, I actually want to show you exactly what I mean by this application. So this is our UberView. We are very proud of UberView. We've put in about $5 million into this, and that's going to be growing. So this is how you can control a light pole from anywhere in the world. So let's say, you know, your head of maintenance decides that, oh, OK, I'm going to go on holiday. I'll see you guys. Well, what happens to your light poles? What if you need something? That's okay. You can easily have people come in and fix it, or he can fix it from wherever he is in the world. To put it in perspective right now, I am in Melbourne, Florida. I'm ironically from Melbourne, Australia, but I'm in Melbourne, Florida now. And I am going to show you some of our lights. So here is a little Ubercell hanging outside of Nashville. I'm going to click on him, 
and I'm able to see everything about him right now. Okay, so he's at 100% brightness. I could drop that and I could save quite a bit of money by doing that. We can see his voltage. We can see if he's on a schedule. Okay, great, he's doing good. We can see his energy consumption. So it's pretty low because this is our little sandbox guy. And we can see his tilt. Okay, great. So he's doing fine. He's straight up, he's safe. No one needs to worry about it. Now let's go into controls. So as you can see, he is on every day, year round, great. And he is on right now at 100% brightness. Well, let's drop that. Let's take it to about 62, because the human eye is still fine at 60% light. It's totally fine. Everyone can still see, everyone's doing well. It's reducing the light pollution. It's reducing your cost. And then I'm just gonna turn them off. And that is how we're helping cities and also ca college campuses, hospital campuses as well, save money, reduce pollution, and take back control of their streetlights. Are there any questions? Yeah, Keely, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you were changing the screen. My, my screen wasn't changing as you walked through that last scenario of altering to 62%, but- Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know if everybody else could see what you were doing, but I, I didn't see any changes on the screen. Can, can you see this now? Are you guys able to see what I'm showing? No, I think this, you only have one page shared, which is that PowerPoint. Oh, oh so it's no, not I'm the so full sorry. screen. No, well, it's just yeah. fine. I appreciate you telling me that. I'm so sorry. So can you guys see this now? It should look yes. a little bit. Yes. There yep. we go. It's in the control oh, okay. at 62%. Yes. OK, there we go. So see this, I'll just quickly go through it again. Here's the little light. I can change the brightness right here. Let's put it up to 98 and let's turn them on. So he is gonna be turning on right now. And I'm able to use this application to take a look at all these different parts about him. So I can actually see okay. his voltage. I can see the brightness, I can see the schedule and I can see the energy consumption, which is the most important part. You want to know exactly how much energy your light pole is consuming. So I apologize. I didn't realize you guys couldn't see that. You were probably like, what is she talking about? That's what I was talking about. So I appreciate that, Joel. Okay. So how much, you know, this this looks fabulous. I, you know, you, you have, I'm just thinking in terms of like one of our hospitals that are building a new, I don't know how many parking light poles they're going to have at the new Alexandria Hospital. Um, is, is there a way to project what the savings would be? I mean, you know, yes. you, yeah, that's, yeah, because that's that's what you sell to the CFO, you know. Well, I'm sorry, I'm trying to, here, I'll go this way. So actually, you guys can have a little fun with this. So we actually have a calculator. Here it is. I can send this to you, Ryan, I'll send it to you. Um, maybe if you could get it or either way, if you can find a way to send it to everyone, you can easily figure it out exactly what your cost savings are gonna be. Alternatively, you can just reach out to me and I'll create one for you. So we're more than happy to do that. We work with cities, college campuses, private entities, hospitals, all sizes, all kinds. We have projects that are over 20,000 light poles. We are ones that are 10 light poles. So everyone is treated the same. We are very proud of our customer service. So any issue that you have, you have any questions, we're right there for you. So can you say something about how much it costs to install the system? So it does vary. We don't install the actual system, but we provide agents who do. And it really does depend on how big your project is. But what we can see, can I, how do I, sorry, I'm not very familiar with Zoom. I'm trying to switch over to this PowerPoint presentation. So for example, this is one of our energy and operational savings. 
So they're looking at 20 year savings. Again, this is 20,000 light poles, right? They're looking at 20 year savings of about $45 million. They're looking at annual savings of $2.2 million. And in terms of CO2 reductions, they're looking at over 56,000 tons or over two, close to 3,000 tons. So you're going to be making that money back that you spend within about a year, two years max. And our ROI calculator calculates that out for you. And that would that would include, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on my phone because my internet is out. And I, I can see what you've got, but it's very small. So that would yeah, include that the cool. cost, the the cost of the hardware and the software and the impl and the installation, everything. Your ROI calculations. Yes, it will. Okay, great. Yes, it, it will explain everything. I'm also happy to clarify any part of it. You know, we have a very dedicated team that specializes in this sort of thing, so we can definitely get you an absolute cost for it. So this this screen here it says calculating the difference for photo cell versus UV cell. Photo cell sun goes down, lights go on, sun comes up, lights go off. UV mm -hmm. cell, you know, how does that how does that differ other than you can program it? I'm I'm, I'm not exactly. Oh sure, clear. yeah. So so our UV cell is the smart photo cell, right? So you know when you're driving past the street light and you see that little nodule on top, that's a photo cell. The okay. difference between our UBA cell and a photo cell is with a UBA cell, you can actually track energy consumption. You can schedule dimming from anywhere in the world. So say, for example, Joel, you decide that you want to go to the UK for a couple of weeks and you didn't set a schedule for your lights. No worries. You can do that with a click of a button from the UK and it's going to translate to the project in Virginia. And you're going to be able to see any issue with a light pole. So, for example, if a car backs into a light pole or a storm comes through, something happens to the light pole, you're going to be alerted of that. And that's just some of the things that it does. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Any other questions that I could answer at this time? Cool. All right. Well, what I can do, Ryan, um, I know you and I have communicated on email. I'm happy to send this over to you. And I definitely love to talk to some of the hospitals that you guys work with because we know that we can help them save money. And at the end of the day, it's not just about saving money. It's about protecting the environment, right? We're reducing light pollution. We're making sure that human lives are protected we're making sure that the actual energy isn't wasted, right? Because so often no one thinks about how much energy is going into a street light and it doesn't have to be that way at all. So I think that this would be a really, really great solution for everybody. Uh, I think it would be a great project. Again, we're in the process of building a, a brand new hospital in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, I certainly can't speak and would not dare to speak for anyone who makes decisions, mind you. Sure. <laughs> and, and I don't know, you know, have they planned out their lights? You know, I, I don't know where, you know, where if, but if I, I would be interested in communicating with our sustainability officer at INOVA and just ask okay. the question, maybe they've already contracted to have whatever lights put up but it's it's certainly can't hurt to ask yeah i mean joel do you mind if i add you on linkedin and we can have a chat about it sure sure perfect perfect great i'm i'm, I'm working with this a uh, smaller hospital also outside of richmond virginia and they're kind of on the outskirts of civilization. I'm not quite sure. I've only been there during the day, so I don't know what kind of lighting they have in their parking lot, but they have a big enough parking lot that it might be as big as seven. So I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you some more about it as well. That'd be great. Well, I mean, let me, can I find you on LinkedIn as well, Cindy? 
Um, sure. Yes, you can. I'm at Virginia it's Commonwealth not... University. Yeah. I can. Yeah. How about this? I'm also going to put my information in the chat. I'll reach out to you guys, but you'll have my direct contacts as well. And I can definitely send this information to you and we can have a chat and see what we can get going because we really would love to help you guys. All of our clients have seen massive benefits and massive changes in the actual situation. So we'd love to be a part of it. Ryan, could you forward those uh, contact information? Because yep. uh, yeah, I, I don't know how I'll get access to the Zoom recording. Okay. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, when the when the recording's on the cloud, I'll distribute it. Yeah, we don't want it on the cloud. Yeah, I got I, I, I got you covered. Yeah, I got you covered. But yeah, well said, Keely. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you so much. No, well, I really, really appreciate you guys letting me come on. I mean, it it's been great meeting you all. I let's keep in touch and let's get some stuff happening because I really would love to help you all. Thank you for joining us, Keely. Uh, it was funny you mentioned the Melbourne, Australia, Melbourne, Florida part. <laughs> I was recently visiting my sister who moved to Melbourne in Australia. Oh, nice. uh, and I kept looking for flights and every once in a while I'll show up at this $300 flight to Melbourne. And I'm like, <laughs> how on earth am I getting all the way over there? For the but it was in Florida. So I was like, Melbourne, Florida. And I had to yeah. figure out why it was named Melbourne, Florida. And it was literally just some dude who lived in Melbourne, Australia for some time. I like that name. And it was just <laughs> it's a classic Florida naming. Yeah. My my daily joke is that I'm an Aussie displaced in the wrong Melbourne. And that often gets a few laughs. But, you know, I, I love both cities. And I've been in the U.S. now nine years. I'm actually going for my citizenship next week. So congrats wish me luck on that one. Thank you. Congrats. You got you got this. Thank you. Well, I really, really appreciate your time, everybody. I know I took up quite a bit of your meeting, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you. All right, I guess Joel will pass the baton over to you and have the yeah, conversation. Yeah, I don't know how many we had, insurance. Yeah, I don't know how many we had an opportunity to at least scan over the article from the uh, uh, IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Um, it, I don't know how I landed on it, but I was fascinated by it. I chair, I co-chair one of our, our quality and safety committees. And we've just finished approving our QAPI initiatives, you know, the Quality Assurance Performance Improvement Plan for the year. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, after reading this article, I said, you know, we really haven't integrated environmental sustainability into our QAPI initiatives. And, you know, I didn't know what other people and other systems, other hospitals, what your experience is and, you know, whether, you know, it's more for a conversation piece than anything, but, I, you know, I, I'd love to see, and I don't know how we'll, I threw it out as an agenda item for us in a couple of, you know, our next monthly meeting. I don't know. It was a, it was a Zoom meeting. It was one of these quiet Zoom meetings. You know, you couldn't read the audience. I don't know if people were falling asleep or rolling their eyes or whatever, but I, and that's why I just kind of wanted to get people's thoughts and, and experiences to, you know, guide us. I mean, you know, I would, I would love to hear more from everybody else on the committee. So Joel, I would, I would say somebody who was connecting uh, very closely quality and sustainability, actually two people, one of them is John Perlin at the joint commission and the other is Don Berwick at IHI. Uh, apparently Berwick, Berwick has gotten big time into the sustainability stuff uh, at IHI. And if you, if you, um, if you go to the Joint Commission sustainability page, they have quotes from a bunch of people, including Berwick. And Berwick is coming to VCU on March 21st, I believe. That should be, he's coming on a Thursday evening. Um, and there's gonna be an invitation going out at some point. And my intention is for um, a bunch of us to get invitations to that um, 
it, it's a, I think it will be available um, as a virtual thing as well as in person. The in person is at V. CU in the, in the College of Health Professions. But um, I've been talking with Dr. Berwick and um, I'm pretty excited about his visit. So um, I'm going to make sure that everybody, when we get the the official invitation, I'll make sure everybody gets a gets a copy. Yeah, that'd be that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah, Joint Committee just finished our triennial uh, survey in, at Alexandria and most of the Inova hospitals did. And it was, you know, it was mentioned as an issue no clear guidance from the Joint Commission. You know, they haven't set out, the, you know, the, the typical standards. They were very much 30,000 foot standards, which is great. It's a start. And I, you know, well, I, you know but I haven't they, heard where things are going to go. Did they talk about their um, uh, sustainability certification with you? No. So there's a certificate they have a, so basically, so John Perlin is one of our alumni at VCU in the program that, that I'm connected to. And he came, I think in the fall to talk to our students and so forth. And um, he intended for this to be a much bigger deal. In fact, he intended for there to be some requirements and uh, he actually, I think they promulgated some requirements a while ago, and he got massive uh, pushback from a whole bunch of people, which he was kind of surprised by. Um, and so they have some voluntary things, voluntary reporting, and also this voluntary certification. The certification process is actually pretty straightforward. Um, you know, what you get for that is a certificate and, you know, the ability to brag about it, but uh, as it's... Um, I'm not going to be able to do a very good job of it off the top of my head, but you can Google certification, you know, um, sustainability certification. And basically, in the first round, all you have to do is measure staff and break it up, Cindy. what uh, you're planning to robotic. reduce and to get recertified, you have to um, so. Oh, sorry. And you, you get everything. everything in this house is bad. Um, anyway, so you you get to pick what you choose to measure and what you say you're going to work on. So it's a pretty straightforward process, and would certainly. Um, I mean, Innova's already doing a bunch of stuff, so it'd be you know pretty easy for you guys. Right. You know, you mentioned on the break, bragging rights component of it, and every time I like drive into Innova Alexandria, I see the big banner for. Um, essentially catheterization for strokes um, that Alexandria and Fairfax are the two Nova hospitals that have it, which is a certificate. It's not a requirement, but it's huge right there in front of your face, very much being bragged about. Um, so I really see at the very least for the kind of coming generations um, choosing hospitals that they potentially want to birth their baby at and all of these things. I think these bragging rights will really matter. This is a sustainable hospital. You know, these generations that are having such a hard time thinking about whether or not they want to bring a child to this world because of the reality of climate change in the future, that the thought of maybe having their child in this super sustainable hospital, I think will be huge. So the, there are a couple of a couple of other groups that for whom the bragging rights would be important, and that is your staff, um, including your physician staff, but also your, you know, everybody, else, especially young people, really care about where they work. And um, the the banner over the parking lot would may be a big deal to them. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I mean, I I've, I talked with Chip Goyet, who's our sustainability officer, and he has approached. Stephen Jones, the Inova CEO, to uh, sign on to the HHS uh, sustainability pledge, and basically was kind of said, "No, we're not sure we're gonna we would achieve that goal." And because they he had questions about achieving a goal, he doesn't want to strive for it. So that's that's a culture shift that has to happen, I think. But I think you're bringing it, up it some is, great but, talking but, points. But yeah. This is a much easier lift than that. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of places for whom the pledge is a little bit too much at the moment, but this is a much easier lift. I'll look that up. That's a big help. 
Uh, do other hospitals, Sarah, you're well into this. Does your, was, you know, does your quality committee? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, Ryan, can I share my screen? Actually, let me just try. Yeah, sure. You should be a co-host right yeah. now. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so this came out uh, unbeknownst to me, which I, which delights me to no end. This came out last week from our quality department um, that they, Carillion every year has a quality conference that's like very well attended. It's like quality is where it's, is what it's all about at Carillion. And I opened it and I read it and I almost fell out of my chair because they're having Jonathan Perlin come in and this is his topic is climate change, health and health equity. And then if you look at the learning objectives, describing the adverse impacts of healthcare on climate change, identify sources of greenhouse gases from health services and articulate strategies to improve health and health equity. All Carillion physicians and staff are invited to this. And it's, and like I said, it's very well attended. And I'm showing you, the, I mean, obviously CME credits are going to be involved. And, and I'm showing you this as maybe something that you could take back to your departments or that might be just be you, Joel. I'm not sure. I mean, it sounds like you've got a pretty significant role. Um, and um, my hope out of this is that this will spark conversation in pockets and identify champions that we never even knew existed um, through this through this talk. So I just would encourage other systems to um, maybe bring that up with there, because I'm sure every health system has a quality conference every year. Um, and, you know, it's, he's and I'm sure he's on doing the circuit right now of, of talks about this sustainable healthcare certification. Um, this is um, this is almost certainly the talk that he gave to us, and he gave it to NCHL. I think right yep. after us. Yep, I'm sure it's, it's the can. It's I mean, I'm sure it's the same, talk. and I care not. Yeah. you know what I oh, mean. No. <laughs> but, no, no, no. It's, I'm just. I, I said that only to say that it. I've I've heard it, uh, and it's it's excellent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm just so excited that there's going to be this many people who have never thought about this, never heard about this, never knew this was a priority to to start in this, in this arena um, and maybe find some alignment with, with areas that we didn't know that we had. Um, this, this looks great. I mean, that looks so inviting. Um, it does, doesn't it? And it just, I don't know. That's why I wanted to show you because it's something that I was very much like, oh yes, on to all the things and the objectives. Like I couldn't ask for a better pitch for the institution than because Dr. Kramer is our, uh, our head of quality and she's very powerful in our institution. So I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that she's at the table for these conversations and so more big, to come. Big help. Thank you. Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, um, excuse me. This is Varun Dixit. Um, I'm the anesthesiologist. I, can I say something? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So Welcome. I, um, I had some experience. I was the quality director in my last job and, um, I started the initiative of uh, reducing the anesthesia gases, which are powerful greenhouse gases. And I was able to improve the efficiency by 41%. And this was in my hospital. And as a quality meeting uh, for the region, mid-Atlantic region, I presented it. And uh, the CMO of the company, which I used to work for, um, they were very excited about the work I did because I measured the, the greenhouse potential of these gases before and after the initiative, what I started. And I showed the, the savings I had financially and also uh, carbon equivalent. And they actually went to CMS and made it a quality uh, measure. So the whole company, uh, Napa, which is the largest and single anesthesia provider in the country, made it as a CMS uh, initiative uh, as a quality metric uh, from the work I have done. And uh, I got a governor's award last year for the for all the work I have done, apart from recycling and other initiatives I started. Um, but it, it was kind of interesting, the hospital, you're talking about bragging rights, that season I'm mentioning it. The hospital did not want to talk about it at all. They did not advertise it. They completely just radio silent about it. They did not mention it to anybody, even in the hospital, even the hosp in the OR where the initiative was started. Nobody knew that we got the governor's award for the work. So it's kind of interesting how, what drives people, but yes, quality can be used as, um, as one of the, 
driving force. Like that's what I did uh, in my role as a quality director. That's great. Are you still with Napa or? So I switched in March last year. I left Napa after six years and I work for HCA now at Chippen Hospital. But um, in next few months, I might, I, I don't know, my, my employment status might change again. But right now I'm working with HCA. And the whole, the move in the job was um, only related to my work in sustainability because HCA was very interested in uh, the low flow initiative I started and recycling and other composting and other things I was doing and they wanted to do implement it in all their 200 different hospitals. At least that's what they told me last year when they recruited me. Um, so they, there is a, there is a potential of taking it, but again, it depends on um, what the hospital is really interested in. Well, let me let me tell you, Alexandria Hospital just switched from Napa to North Star. So yes, why, I know. why don't you go work at North Star and we'll make a connection? Yeah, I, I actually did a gave a grand round last year in uh, Inova when it was uh, with Napa. I was invited there and uh, they were all the anesthesia resident. They grand rounds. So I actually went there and um, gave a talk to them about my work. This is uh, just before I got the award. And the award I received was the Virginia, uh, like the Governor's Sustainability uh, Award, which is across the specialties, like across the industries, not just for healthcare and hospital. It's for like every industry. Um, so it's actually a very big deal. Uh, but somehow hospital was not interested in having any bragging rights at all. We have to change that culture. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Varun, may I ask where you were working and where you are now? I understand you mentioned the, the companies or the... Yeah, I, I'm at in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm working at Chippenham Hospital there right now. Okay. And the work we I did, most of the today. work I did was at Henrico Doctors Hospital, which is also in Richmond. Yeah, Dr. Dixon. In Richmond. Um, Go ahead, I I, oh, I was going to say, I think I still have your presentation that you gave about two months ago in, in Rico. Um, do you want me to share it with the group? Yeah. Your I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all. I, I really appreciate being able to bounce thoughts off of you, you, you guys. So very helpful and gave me some guidance here. I love that idea of that initiative around quality, kind of connecting quality measures and, um, and sustainability. I think it's fantastic. Joel, may I ask you just for a little bit of a kind of like the technicalities education? I have a little bit of knowledge of kind of the level of work that goes into getting policy into whatever organization's policy data. How often does that work happen in the hospital system? How often is that kind of acronym that you used uh, set? Is that a yearly thing? How long does that process take? Yeah, Who's usually a, involved in it? Yeah. Yeah, it's an annual you know, requirement to review your quality initiatives, which include, you know, your ER wait times, or, you know, that's an example uh, that you can relate to. But there's a whole slew of those metrics and quality and safety that is agreed upon at the beginning of the year. We just approved our quality initiatives. Uh, and that's when it occurred to me, again, after reading this IHI paper, Ooh, wait a minute now. Well, maybe we should have had a comp. Maybe we should need to make some changes to our current initiatives. So that's that's really what I'm hoping to do. Again, as I said, I couldn't read the Zoom, read the room, in terms of response and people's interest or otherwise. But you know, I I I threw it out there as an agenda item forthcoming. My co-chair Lydia Halley, who co-chairs the committee, well, you know Lydia. Um, seemed enthusiastic about it too so you know we'll keep digging at it and you know it, the, as you asked about policies and systems as you know i know the policy changes occur with glacial speed 
and it's it, it's a little frustrating, but you know, if it's a good idea, um, it, it it would I think be worth it uh, to push it up the top and get the uh, the head the VP of Safety and Quality, uh, whom we work closely with, to uh, to to buy it. And our own local hospital quality chair is very interested in sustainability. So I'm we're working our way, working our way. And just so, uh, so I understand I, each one of these, oh, sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Follow sorry. up question. Each one of these are set by different Innova hospitals separately. And then there's like a more uh, umbrella version of them. Yeah, I think there's basically a template that every hospital uses and then individually, you know, most of it lately, including, you know, the, the system puts it out, the Inova Health System puts it out, and it's maybe modified slightly depending upon what what specialties are available at your own hospital that they tweak it, but the, the overriding general principle. So if, if we can crack into the Inova Quapi initiative in terms of sustainability, that would then uh, uh, fan out to five hospitals eventually. It might take a year cycle, but it would eventually be incorporated to all the Inova hospitals. Thank you. Over to you, Varun. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 that's fine. So I'm just giving you my experience about the low flow initiative. So the way we did was there was no quality, like was no policy initially. It was just just my initiative. And I just just started educating my staff in the anesthesia department. But then the CMO picked it up and uh, he ran away with it, made it a not a really policy because we don't have an FDA approval of low flows actually. Um, so what he did was he, in the anesthesia chart and the electronic chart, he added a metric. And just like reminder, did you lo use low flows for this case or not? And um, like, if, if not, why not? So people have to like, People who are sitting on fence or just forgot about it, there's one more thing like, oh, I need to do you those flows. And they uh, they just hopefully will slowly switch their practice. His idea was always um, like carrots more than stick. Uh, just try to persuade people. That's how they implemented in their uh, in in the in the company rather than. Um, like forcing people to do it. Although I was in the opposite direction, like you should just make it a um, requirement that everybody should have educational session and should ask to do low flows, but he was. So what I'm saying is instead of having a proper policy, it was more like nudging them towards the, the right thing. Varun, would it be possible to get like I'll call it the fifth graders understanding of what you're talking about and the guidance <laughs> in the event. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I... so sorry. Like I, I apologize. I'm so used to like, no, 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 no. I, I'd like, like to go ro to roaming end. around in the anesthesia groups, you know, like just give me like, so the way, the way anesthesia works is that you give an IV medication to put people to sleep and then to maintain anesthesia, which anesthesia means, uh, amnesia and um, not responding to stimulation. That's what anesthesia means. And uh, for that, maintaining the anesthesia, uh, why uh, after patient goes to sleep, uh, what we do is do anesthesia gases. So we uh, pump gases with the ventilator, with the oxygen, we also uh, add some anesthesia gases. And as long as there is a certain partial pressure of those gases in the brain, patient does not respond to surgical stimulation. And you turn off those gases and patient wakes up. Um, those anesthesia gases been around for 110 plus years. They have improved a lot. The problem is that as they have improved, they are halogenated uh, chlorofluorocarbons and they have extremely high um, uh, greenhouse potential. So one hour of anesthesia is equivalent to driving your car for 20 miles. And uh, so imagine doing 15 to 20,000 surgeries in an average hospital with 
um, multiple hours of anesthesia, it adds a lot of greenhouse gases. And uh, the the way it is done, it can be, um, it is very wasteful way of doing it. And it can be, uh, it can be, the efficiency can be improved tremendously. So my work was um, educating the staff about becoming more efficient and uh, reducing the gas flows rather than uh, keeping the maximum flows. Like if you are, one simple analogy is like if you are cleaning your dishes in the sink, you can leave the tap on maximum while you're doing the dishes, or you can just use water when you are um, using the dishes or reduce the flow of the water. Like I it roughly translates to what my work was. So I explained them and, and um, asked them to reduce the flows rather than pumping that much gas because the gas is not metabolized by the body and the gas which is not used by the body is actually just pumped out of the environment uh, in like scavenged out in the atmosphere. So uh, there is no need to keep pumping anesthesia gases. You, if you reach a state, steady state, you just have to maintain it that level. Now, I, I know it's kind of comp more technical than I would like it to, but well, what I'd love to do is I'd love to take this work to our chief of anesthesia, know him well, and basically, you know, see. I don't know what we're doing. I'm an internist. Uh, I don't know what ROR is doing, but I'd love to be able to find out. And if we're not doing what we should be doing, make make some suggestions because they're part That's of North Star, right. which is a huge anesthesia group that would impact. Yes. I think all of the uh, Inova hospitals. Yeah, so uh, are you an Inova hospital? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so I, actually, as I said before, I gave a grand rounds to the anesthesia department about this topic last year around February, actually, exactly February. And Dr. Ron Banks and the cardiac anesthesiologist and chief of trauma invited me. And they are very well aware of this thing. This is not new knowledge. This has been around for almost 100 years now. Uh, it's just that people don't implement it. So I actually, I'm very confident they know about the concept. You can definitely ask them, are they doing it? And if not, okay. what are the barriers? And how can we make them do it? Great. I'm Thank aware you. of North Star as well, because I, uh, I interviewed them at one point. So, um, Joel, just one other thing. Um, it's Joe. Um, I, on our sustainability committee, not that we're, we're going to talk about anesthesia tonight, but um, just that what you may also want to bring are, I worked with our anesthesiology department, who is NAPA, and they eliminated desflurane and, and as Varun said, have these metrics for low flow. The other thing that we're doing that we've kind of tied is the nitrous oxide that's being um, pumped through the walls, 95% of it actually escapes into the atmosphere. So we're converting our nitrous oxide into E-cylinders that the anesthesiologist only uses for the immediate case to decrease the wastage that's going out into the atmosphere. So we're working with our um, current facilities person to convert that over to. So if you're gonna talk to your head of anesthesia, you may wanna loop that Great. in as well. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, I I've learned a lot. Oh, <laughs> I was yeah, say same. That. I always you know, I have to say, same. I'm not. I'm not a doctor, and I just <laughs> learned a lot tonight. So, right. yes. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for having me, guys. I really appreciate right. it. Thank, thank you, everyone. No problem. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I know it can be boring sometimes if it's not your field. No, that's me. Oh, that's okay. No, 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 that's... Sorry, great. Doctor love Dixon, love. we definitely would love to have you back for another one of our sessions. If you could to hear your full presentation, if you'd be willing to share with the group, we would absolutely. So I would love to. Have absolutely, I love to have that. And when you brought nitrous oxide, and nitrous oxide has a half life of 120 years. And actually anesthesia is one of the only industries left in the world where nitrous, nitrous oxide is still used. And it's one of the only gases left now that actually causes ozone layer depletion. Because when we were like a few years ago, there were chlorofluorocarbons in refrigeration, which were causing ozone layer depletion. Now it's just the nitrous oxide. And 
I, in my 17 years of anesthesia experience, I've never used nitrous oxide. It's completely useless uh, gas, but some people really want to use it. And and as as you already mentioned, it's like 95% of that is wasted. So there is no need for doing it anyways. Can I, bring I would love to share my experience anytime, anytime anybody is interested. I'm always available to um, talk about it. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch, Dr. Dixit, to, to get you on the calendar. That would be wonderful. Joanne, were you going to say something? Yeah, I know we're over, but I just kind of feel like this is the form. We don't have a lot of people on this. And I think a lot of people on this call are a lot further along in the process at their institutions than where I am at my institution in terms of trying to get buy-in. Um, and I'm still kind of banging down that door and you guys probably all know this. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I came across, um, you know, I had gone to the climate RX that, uh, Abigail, you talked about at the last mm -hmm. meeting again, sorry, my camera's not working, um, and got the badges and I'm trying to get to my ELT to kind of get everybody. But I sort of then went down the rabbit hole on the climate RX website and got to eco America. And then from Eco America got to Climate for Health and mm -hmm. the Climate for Health um, Ambassador course that you can take. Mm -hmm. um, and so I took that course and you kind of get the certification and you'd kind of say, OK, you know, what's the big deal? Well, I then sent that to some of the people on my executive leadership and said, you know, hey, this is the work I'm doing on my own because the certificate says now, you know, Dr. Andrish is now a, you know, climate ambassador and is approved to kind of speak to climate health. And two of them responded back and they were like, wow, that's great. Good for you. And so instead of me just sort of being this doc who's really passionate about it, um, it, it gave just a little bit more validity and credentials to it. So if somebody sort of at the infancy stages at their institution, it may be something to pursue and then just kind of say, hey, you know, I actually went through this four hour course and can kind of speak to these things with a little bit more intelligence. So I just thought I'd share that with the group. That's fantastic. And actually I'm hoping uh, in the process of confirming that our March meeting will have the climate our ex folks on. Yeah, and just to add on two points. One is, and I don't think you said this, but I want to be sure. Um, it's not a freebie. I mean, the badge is supposed to be earned by getting the training. Um, and that's the reward. And it's also the opportunity. I, in fact, forgot to wear mine today. Uh, I was on Capitol Hill two weeks ago and I wore mine. But today, when I was supposed to wear it for climate, I didn't wear it. Um, because we were doing a lot of climate activities in Richmond uh, uh, on the Hill. Uh, the second point I want to make is uh, a colleague of mine, um, uh, in Connecticut, which is a smaller state geographically, uh, they were able to bring, uh, and they're they're an independent, um, um, a de uh, decentralized uh, public health service. So the local communities have their own local health director, and and they're independent of. I mean, they work with the state, but they're not a state employee. So long story short, they all came together for a half day meeting, uh, maybe stayed for lunch, whatever. But um, my colleague arranged with the same people you were just talking about, uh, uh, climate and health uh, at, uh, at Eco America, and uh, they did the training for everybody all at once. So they slam dunked, what, 50 local public health directors uh, and, and then awarded them the, uh, the badges. So um, uh, just an idea. I was thinking of maybe doing that uh, uh, with um, uh, one of our groups uh, and or even the Virginia Public Health Association, if they, if they would get behind climate a little bit more than they have been. Um, well, you know, that's something we could do in uh, maybe locally. So FYI. Great. And the last thing I'll say is I just, I got in an email, um, I put in the a link in the chat. There's with Earth Day coming up, there are several different national challenges and there's this one healthcare eco challenge for 2023. Um, I haven't done a whole, it's it's hosted by Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic and Peace Health. And I think it's just a fun opportunity for engagement from clinicians and administration and offices and healthcare across the country. And I think it usually runs the week of Earth Week. 
Um, but I put the link in there for you to look at. And there's a webinar coming up um, in, I think it's February 22nd on, on the background for it. So if that might be something you or your green team or your sustainability team might be interested in, um, just wanted to share that opportunity. Uh, Sarah, could that be emailed out? Because uh, I'm yeah. I'm ra I'm trying to write down like a crazy person, and I'm yes. not gonna okay. I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> yep, I I'll, I got it. Good, thank you. All right, well we are at time. Thank you guys so much for your for joining us on this um, Thursday night, and uh, hope everyone's doing well. And we'll see you in a month. Okay. Thank you all so right, much. See y'all. All right. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.